Uh, welcome to one of my series of videos for patients. Today I'll be telling you about the process of stem cell transplant as a treatment for multiple myeloma. Um, as uh, you well know, in 2017, stem cell transplant remains a key option in the treatment of multiple myeloma for uh, most patients who are eligible for it. And that usually means anyone who's under the age of 75 who's otherwise fit and healthy, um, that meaning you just have you know, regular health status and occasionally we'll do this in patients over the age of 75. So I'd like to walk you through the principles, the basics, and then what to expect. So first of all, uh, transplant is, is a standard part of the treatment. And for most patients where we do this, we do this as frontline therapy. In other words, this is not a rescue strategy. It's not a Hail Mary pass. It can be used as, as, as treatment for someone who's relapsed, but the, the majority of patients is done as part of upfront uh, therapy. Second of all, the treatment is the malformation. The stem cells are just a support system that we have so we can rebuild your bone marrow after you get your malformation. And again, I'll explain all of this, how, how it occurs and happens um, in, in great uh, detail. Third, transplant is a very safe procedure. The rate of serious complications, including mortality associated with transplant, is actually quite low. Mortality should be in the order of less than 1%, which is really the rate of um, a major transplant centers uh, at large hospitals and academic institutions. As I always tell my patients, easier said being the doctor, but it's an involved procedure, it's a big deal, but it's a very safe one. And oftentimes the, the, the risks and the complications, including those that become very serious, are just as high as what you get with the chemotherapy that you may have received before the transplant. In a separate video, I will explain how we go about collecting stem cells, but suffice it to say that before you can move to the uh, stem cell transplant, we need to make sure that we have enough stem cells so we can rebuild your bone marrow, and that's a process we call stem cell harvesting. And obviously, this is a must-have. Uh, you wouldn't be able to repopulate the bone marrow, or build the bone marrow again, unless we had enough of those stem cells. In the case of myeloma, uh, the stem cell transplant is almost always, and with very few exceptions, done with your own stem cells. So we don't have to look for donors. We don't have to go to databases. We use your own stem cells, the good cells, that are able to build your your bone marrow. And we can get those from the peripheral blood. Again, will be explained on a separate uh, video. So let's decide we, we offer stem cell transplant to a patient with myeloma. The first question would be why? Well, stem cell transplant, as I mentioned, remains a key tool in the management of the disease. From all of what we're learning and what we know from clinical trials, for patients who are able to go through this procedure, we know that stem cell transplant adds significantly the amount of time that a person will have with their disease under control and the amount of time that will elapse from the time you start treatment until the time that potentially you may need a treatment again. Not only that, but there's a, a subset of patients and unfortunately still a small subset of patients where stem cell transplant may be the last intensive treatment they need. In other words, for a small minority of patients, stem cell transplant can be curative. Uh, to best exemplify this, I'll, I'll point you out to the data of a Spanish uh, study that was done now many years ago and uh, was reported in 2011. They looked at the very long-term outcomes of patients who would go through the stem cell transplant as primary treatment for myeloma. Now, they looked at 20-year uh, outcomes. So, so if, you, if you have to dial the, the clock back then 20 years, as you can imagine, many of those patients did not get the chemotherapy forms for what we call induction or the very first line of treatment that you receive that are as modern as what we have now. But nevertheless, uh, from that group of patients, about a third of patients were able to reach that stage that we call complete uh, remission or complete response. Um, uh, what that means is that you can't measure the myeloma anymore using some of the standard laboratory um, assays that have been done. And what they found is that if you track these patients at the end of 20 years, about a third of them have not had 
evidence of the myeloma coming back. So obviously that's that's very good news. It speaks to the power that um, uh, a treatment like transplant can have. So that's the reason we do it. It improves overall survival. And at the very least, it uh, improves the odds that the time will go by and, and uh, patients will need treatment only after a longer period of, of uh, follow-up. With the current uh, strategies we have for the treatment, that is with the first-line treatment, then the transplant, and then after that, uh, some form of maintenance, which is pretty standard, and we will cover in another video, you can think about somewhere in the range of about five to perhaps even six years uh, on the average. And what that means is if you take 100 patients, out of those 100 patients, that would be uh, the average until the time they need an additional form of more aggressive treatment. Now, uh, there are some patients that obviously are gonna need treatment earlier than that, but then there's those patients that are gonna be, um, as I told you before, uh, far out, many years out, they really have not required additional therapy. So that's why we do it. And remember, this is a transplant we do with your own stem cells. Um, I get questions often, do I look for a donor or you know, can we use a stored cord that we had on one of my, my grandkids? And the answer again is no, we're gonna be using your own, your own stem cells. So what happens? So this is what happens in a nutshell. Um, we, we go through all the testing and we have the stem cells collected and it has been determined that a person is a good candidate for a stem cell transplant. So in my clinic, I usually will see a patient say on a Tuesday. And then we talk about transplant uh, and we go through what to expect. We do a physical examination. And usually the patient will be admitted on a Wednesday. That very first day, and that Wednesday, uh, the patient uh, will be admitted to the hospital, you know, bring gets uh, the gowns, the, um, all the information that is needed for the nurses. And immediately that first day, the patients will get the chemotherapy administered intravenously. And the medication is called Melphon, and it's pretty standard. Most patients will get a dose that is calculated based on their height and their weight, something we, we use that's called a body surface area. So most patients will get 200 milligrams of melphalan uh, per um, a meter of body surface area. And that's something that, again, is pretty standard. In some situations, we'll do adjustments and people are trying other things in clinical trials. Now that chemo is given intravenously. Uh, in, in our case, patients do have one of those permanent IV catheters that can stay there for many days, what's called a PIC line, P-I-C-C, a PIC line and the medication is injected there and it's given over one hour. Uh, before you get the, the medicine, of course, the nurses will give you very powerful anti-nausea medicines. Um, so for most patients, the, the time immediately after the chemo is usually not the one where we see a lot of nausea, vomiting, or symptoms of the like. Uh, during that time as well, too, we will ask patients to be very careful in uh, following what we recommend that we call the cryotherapy, and this is uh, using ice chips in your mouth. The reason we do that is that the ice chips will reduce the blood flow to the lining of the mouth and your throat. And in the old days, you know, we, we didn't do this. Patients used to have very significant problems with uh, sore throat, um, uh, pain, sometimes difficult even swallowing. But if you do the ice chips carefully, this is reduced very, very significantly. So. The nursing team will have you do ice chips before, during, and sometime after the chemo. And again, the reason is, uh, you know, the, the coldness of the ice reduces the blood flow to blood vessels. Uh, we reduce the blood flow to the lining of the throat and the mouth, and that in turn reduces how much chemotherapy gets there. And that's for that. That's usually the, the, the first day. Again, patients tend to do very well. The day after, so say if you came on a Wednesday, on Thursday, that's kind of a rest day and nothing happens. And for most patients, they are asymptomatic at this point. And then come, thir come Friday, uh, the pe person will get the stem cells back into their body. Uh, the way this works is that the cells that were collected before usually are kept in little bags. Those bags are, are frozen away and they're kept safely in the blood bank so that two days later after you get your chemo, they can be safely given, be given back into the body. Uh, the chemotherapy only lasts uh, for about a day or so in, in, in the person's body. So the day after, if I tried to measure it, I couldn't. All of what we see after are the side effects and the after effects of chemo, but the, the chemical compound itself is gone from your body. 
so again, comes Friday, you know, there's there's a team that comes with what, what I call uh, the squeaky wheel water bath. So there's a water bath, a little contraption there that comes where actually those bags are, are, are thawed out and then they're infused into the veins. Um, and they go back into the body right from the get-go. They're going to get busy and, and try to build the bone marrow again. You may be wondering, how is it that those cells know where to go? How do they get back into the bone marrow? Well, the cells do have some uh, markers on their surface that we call receptors that allow them to know where they need to go. Um, the analogy I use is uh, that they have matching Velcro straps that match those that are inside the bones in the space of the bone marrow. And if you see some of the videos that are out there that you know show you the link between the bone marrow space and the circulation, your arteries and your veins, you'll see that for all practical purposes, the space inside of our bones and, and our circulation are one and the same. So, you know, within minutes, within seconds, sometimes as you get those cells back, they're gonna start going and they're gonna start finding their niche inside the bones in the space we call the bone marrow. And, you know, of course, very happy they're gonna start growing again. But just like if you plant seeds for a garden, you won't see green the day after. So, you know, the cells go there and it's gonna take about two weeks before they fully recover. It's not going to happen right away. And what we're going to see is that during those two weeks, we're going to have the person's old bone marrow very slowly die as a consequence of that methyl and chemotherapy. And ultimately, we see the rise of the new bone marrow come out of the growth of those stem cells. And for that first uh, week, you know, since you get the methyl, most patients actually do pretty good. Uh, there's, there's, uh, the possibility of some symptoms. Some people will um, get GI problems, again, nausea and vomiting, but the majority of patients do very well. And then from that point on, the, the second week or so, it tends to be a little bit harder on the individual. You know, you got a big dose of chemo, so there, there is no doubt that this chemo can be toxic and uh, affects our body in multiple ways. So, uh, for instance, uh, what we did with the eyes, we can't do that with the rest of, of the gut, the small bowel, the large bowel. So it's not unusual for people to have things like diarrhea or have uh, crampy abdominal pain. And just know that this is all something that will resolve as your body heals back from, from the chemotherapy. Not unusual as well, too, for people to feel fatigued and tired. And actually, it's more common at this point that people will uh, uh, report difficulties with eating and drinking and perhaps lack of appetite. And again, it's not the chemo's in your body. The chemo is gone. It's just that your body is suffering from the after effects of that chemotherapy. Now, this is not to say that the symptoms are predictable or uniform. You know, there are some people who we see in the hospital and just walking around the nurse's stations with no problems and, you know, doing, doing that quite happily. Where there's some patients that just prefer to stay under the sheets and you know uh, not be quiet and not be doing much. And what we're going to do is we're going to wait for that two-week period from when you get your stem cells until they show that, that they can grow and they can support a new bone marrow before the person is allowed to leave the hospital. The three main criteria we have for a patient to leave the hospital are very very simple. One is we know the counts have recovered. Two is there is no evidence of uh, fever or infections. And three, we wanna make sure that you're eating and you're drinking fine so you can support yourself. And you know, if you go home, you don't become dehydrated. So it's, those are the three, three main criteria. When the cells come back, it's quite surprising because uh, what, what we see is, let's say on, on that second week towards the, the second half of that second week in the hospital, somewhere around day 12 or so, and this can vary a little bit back and forth, we will see that we see glimpses of those cells coming back. You know, and they go, uh, for instance, the, the white cells may come down from almost zero or zero to uh, somewhere halfway between zero and normal and the day after they're normal. So their, their growth and the, the way we see those, those blood counts come back is what we would call exponential. It goes from almost zero to normal in a couple of days. And just be reassured, when those counts come back, they do come back. They're not fragile, it just is the, the days it took for them to grow back. And usually patients will keep those counts that are, are seen at the time that they're leaving the, the hospital. Now, during, during time that you're in the hospital and that you haven't recovered, you know, other symptoms can occur. So uh, 
your, your white count will be low and can be very low for several days. And that makes a person more susceptible uh, for an infection. And usually, you know, what we would worry about is if someone develops a fever. Now, because we don't know for sure if there's an infection or not, uh, we usually treat and ask questions later. So if you're in, in the hospital going through a transplant procedure and are, are uh, developing a fever, we'll collect blood cultures and get x-rays and blood work and the usual things. But right from the get-go, we'll start patients on antibiotics to try to get ahead of the curve. We, we want to be uh, treating that um, early on so that we prevent any serious infections. When, when fever occurs, it uh, doesn't always reflect an infection. In fact, uh, it's quite possible that it just reflects uh, the passage of bacteria through your body that uh, triggers the same kind of response that our body gets when we get an infection. But in fact, the bacteria don't form a seeded infection. It's just a transient passage of those bacteria through the bloodstream, what we call a transient bacteremia. It is possible that someone would have also a very low platelet count. And, um, and to fix that, we normally would provide platelet transfusions. But it's amazing what low level of platelets our body can tolerate. And, and the reality is for most patients, bleeding is not um, um, uh, a major issue, but it's obviously something we need to monitor very, very carefully. And last but not least, if your bone marrow is not working, then the red cells could go down. So, so there might be need of transfusion of, of, of red cells as well too, which is again, not, not out of the, the ordinary. I, I, I do tell patients, you know, just be patient when you're in the hospital, it's gonna take some time. Um, the, the nursing team in our site does 97% of the work. They're absolutely outstanding. Um, everything is driven through, through, through protocol. They know what to do, they know what to expect, and they know when to call if there's um, any, any problems that arise. Usually what we'll do is, you know, as a team, we'll, we round up in the morning, so everything goes by your bedside, we review the blood work, we'll, we'll tell you where we are, and, um, um, you know, normally patients are assigned to one of the advanced providers, either a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, and they, you know, they will work with you, but there's always someone available, including the physician in charge of, of the hospital service. At our site, we allow visitors and, you know, the, the rooms are pretty normal. You see the hospital rooms when you go there and they look quite normal. Um, people can spend the night. We just don't like to have uh, big crowds um, out for, um, uh, as, as far as visitors, but for the most part, you know, we, we, we allow the visitors and the, and the rooms look, uh, for the most part, quite uh, normal. So, um, once a patient is ready, the patient can leave the hospital and, and, and again this is this is something that varies across the various institutions that do transplant but uh, what we find is that uh, we have to give specific instructions on what to look for um, and you know obviously report if you couldn't be eating right if, if there was some issue with fever but then it's going to take several weeks uh, before your body gets uh, fully recovered from the transplant procedure. There's, there's somewhat of an intense schedule for, for monitoring once a patient leaves the, the transplant unit. So we, we know we're, um, you know, we're um, in, in, um, in a good path, we're aligned and the, the whole process for recovery is going well. And again, depending on which institution you're getting your transplant, just talk to your providers about what the, that schedule uh, might be like. So, um, and then, you know, usually here, the, the next big appointment after that initial phase will be two months out when we will do a whole assessment again of, of, of how much progress the, the person has, has made. Uh, patients that are hospitalized for transplant, of course, have to be subjected to being awakened multiple times during the day, sometimes for vital signs, for blood work, which we like to do early on, of course, because it's important we have the results back by the time we are, uh, are doing rounds. Um, your appetite may or may not be there, and, and I think uh, we try to encourage patients to eat by mouth, but sometimes you can't, and if you were to fall far behind, we can always uh, supplement that in the form of, of uh, different forms of intravenous uh, nutrition. Um, sometimes patients, uh, it's important they will see uh, people come into the room that are dressed in gowns, and their you know, gowns are co come in multiple colors. Most of the time when we do that, it's just to prevent the spread of bacteria from the room of one patient to another. 
uh, there's really nothing unique about going into the room of a patient who has um, uh, a bone marrow transplant. In fact, the one key thing, the one thing we tell everyone is just do hand washing. That's all that's required, use hand washing. Uh, but if for whatever reason we were to detect a bacteria in you or another uh, patient like you going through a treatment, we may want to put gowns just so that we can prevent those bacteria from spreading from one patient to the next. And, and that technique has proven to be very, very effective. Also, patients have mentioned you might see personnel sometimes come with different gowns, either when you get the stem cells being infused or when the chemotherapy is going to be given or, or um, oftentimes as they need to look at one of the catheters. But this is all for your prevention. There's nothing, uh, nothing other than just uh, that being a protective barrier and, and helping you out. Um, feel free to ask questions. I always tell patients, you know, this is where we invented the word patient. You have to be very patient when you go through this. We understand it's a long process. I sort of have joking tell my patients, you know, we'll, we'll come in the morning. We're just sort of happy and we'll see you. And we're kind of telling you, you know, things look pretty good. And you say, gosh, I don't, I don't feel that well. And the analogy I use is like, uh, imagine yourself running a marathon. We know you're doing great times. You're, you're reaching your goals. Uh, yet, if you're running the marathon, you don't necessarily feel that good, but we'll, we'll provide you with feedback, and I think all centers do that. So I hope you found this uh, video um, uh, useful, and um, uh, please talk to your providers as you think about what's entailed in going through a stem cell transplant.